Okay, yes, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to another brand new Rugby Muscle Podcast. I'm your host as always, TJ, and we are today continuing this series of Rugby Muscle Applied and a hypertrophy-specific series of Rugby Muscle Applied. So we're on to Hypertrophy 102, how to progress your muscle growth. In the last episode, we spoke about how you can... Um, like why you want to get muscle growth, why uh, and and the real run through the real basics of hypertrophy, what it is, how you can like the real basics of how you can go about achieving it. Seems pretty general, and that's why people won't pay attention to it because they'll be like, oh, you know, there's no way I can just can just do these simple basic principles and continue to keep growing muscle, but you can, but you've got to understand a few things um, in terms of your progression. So. That is what we are going to cover in today's episode. If you're watching on the YouTubes, thumbs up, read us, help out the channel. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, as always, um, go ahead and give us a five-star review and you'll be in with a shot of winning one of our free giveaways. Um, and also, if you're listening to it on the podcast, hit subscribe as well because we will be continuing this um, Rugby Muscle Applied series throughout for a good few num or good number of uh, continued episodes, particularly with hypertrophy as well. And in fact, if you're on the YouTube as well, put a comment in below, um, or if you're listening on the podcast, go to the Rugby Muscle Athletes Facebook page and ask any questions that you have on muscle growth because they, you know, especially after watch listening to this episode and the episode before it, there's still going to be some questions that you guys might have for me, and I will want to make sure that they get answered in some of the future uh, rugby muscle applied. So that's how you can interact with that. But without further ado, let's get into it. We've spoken already um, in the last episode about why you'd want to continue to get hypertrophy. Um, we've spoken the benefits of how it makes everything else better. Um, but obviously there are circumstances where we sort of hit a plateau and we say, well, why would we want to revisit hypertrophy or I'm focusing on strength or I'm focusing on power. Why would I still want to prioritize hypertrophy? Why not just get like big enough and then continue to work strength or power forever? Like why would that not be a viable option? And it's quite simply that if you continue to add size, um, you continue to be able to add, you can continue to be able to add strength um it's not quite as linear right so you hit more of a plateau with your muscle growth than you do with your strength but it gets to a certain point where a certain muscle only has a certain amount of or a certain size of muscle only has a certain amount of firing capability it only has a certain amount of strength potential within that muscle the easiest way to make that muscle stronger is to make it bigger. It then has the potential to be much stronger after that and will allow you to continue to gain strength, continue to gain power. That's why, you know, if you look throughout all of professional rugby here in 2020 or 2021, you will see big guys because they are allowed that, you know, those are the most, they have the most strength, the most power. And now there are some skinny guys that are there, but, you know, they end, you know, most skinny rugby players, even the professionals, end up um, adding more size to their frame because it helps with everything else. So, if you can continue to add muscle to your frame, you continue to increase the amount of strength potential, the amount of power potential, um, everything that you have. So, it, to me, it's a no-brainer that hypertrophy work should be part of your program at most points in your rugby playing career particularly if you're an amateur that hasn't reached the, you know, the giant um, sizes that you see with professional rugby players or particularly the giant size that you see of Ronnie Coleman. Like the notion that you get bodybuilders, that you get quote unquote non-functional muscle just doesn't quite exist. It doesn't quite add up. Yes, you know, Ronnie Coleman might not be, you know, is, is a good example, but any, any sort of um, bodybuilder out there might not have the best one rep max strength going, but all of them are strong within their rep ranges. You look at the weights they use, they're still big weights, and they pump them out for, even if they're pumping out for 15, 20 reps, they're still big weights. You just don't get guys that are that size and are weak. It doesn't happen. Um, you, If you're bigger, you're going to always be stronger, even if you're working different rep ranges, right? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Someone that isn't functional because they're big is just not a good rugby player. That doesn't necessarily mean that 
you know they're weak or they have muscle that doesn't quite work no muscle will always have potential to contract and so then that begs the question well well then why do we plateau like what happens here with our um, hypertrophy like why do we want to look at progression why can't we just continue to add weight forever and ever and ever it's kind of obvious but it's worth restating the fact that you um sort of start to plateau is what makes us somewhat uh short-sighted and impatient when it comes to our um hypertrophy training we tend to especially the first year or so of your training is really easy to progress your weights it's really easy to you know almost every single week right it feels like you're adding two to five kilos on the bar you're adding even more on the bar and you're adding reps and it just it's like magic and, it, and this is the sort of process that for me personally helped me get addicted to the gym like it's a it's amazing how you can just um continue to progress just by showing up week on week on week um but eventually after a year or so at least that sort of starts to peter out and it gets a lot slower and then after that period of time it starts to slow down it becomes a lot more difficult to add weight and you think well what am i doing wrong what i did to begin with really was working and now all of a sudden i'm slowing down i'm plateauing um this is a disaster maybe i need to do some sort of you know changing up maybe i've got to keep the body guessing maybe i'll do something novel um the reality is that you've just got used to the idea or your body has got used to the idea of strength training or or, or or weight training and that in turn has led the body to be able to adapt to that weight and it's it's got strong enough that it needs to be and now you really have to sort of wring out the sponge to keep pushing hypertrophy or keep pushing strength but not necessarily even wring out the sponge you just have to try and you have to put more thought into it because for the first year or so, or maybe six months of your training, or, and most of you watching this that have already done that amount of training, can absolutely attest that it's it's really like remarkable how much you progress when you first start going to the gym. And then it starts to slow down. And it doesn't start to slow down because you've done anything wrong. It starts to slow down because that's just how it works. It, it just is the way the body works. It becomes accustomed to that strength training. And you have to push it further and further and further. The stimulus has now become less and less and less novel. Like you, your body now knows what a bench press is. The first time you, you put a bench press on or you put the bar, you know, you, you sit yourself underneath a bar and you bench press it up, there's a completely new stimulus that the body's never even felt before. And now it has to figure out how to, so it adapts really like, like in a gross way, in a big way, by adding a lot of strength, by adding a lot of muscle straight up. And then over time, that, um, adaptation gets smaller and smaller and smaller which means you have to eke out like different methods to or different ways to m ensure that you are progressing and keep pushing that um keep pushing that uh what what do we say keep pushing the 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 muscle within the body you know keep pushing that volume keep pushing that overall tension keep pushing that progression um to keep the body growing right not keep the body guessing because that is something that does not work. We've, we've learned in the last one, you have to continually, uh, progressively overload a muscle systemically in order to um, like make sure it grows. And we'll go into that in a little bit more in the, as we get into this podcast. And what people want to see, and the idea is that what sells them on like all these different wacky sort of training methods, like advanced methods that they think they need or um, special training methodologies what sells them is that they want to get that progress like they did when they first started getting in the gym they want to you know they, they want to have overcome this plateau and not just overcome it but they want the gains that they had before so often i've trained with people that have been able to add significant weight to the bar week on week and i say significant like you know two to five kilos is still a significant amount of weight but they've been able to add that week to week to week and they still think that's not enough and they still want to change it up because they think that the grass can be greener on the other side or they think that there's another stone that they've left unturned that can all of a sudden spark their newbie progress once again and unfortunately that's just not the case because the stimulus that you're imposing on yourself week on week on week isn't novel anymore it's not the same as when you first started lifting and sometimes guys think that that happens but really what actually happens is they take time off they or they spend time fucking around and they do other um 
things that they actually get smaller and they become less and less skilled at the movements. They, um, like the, they, they, their, their body almost forgets the stimulus that they, they, they then reintroduce with whatever training method it is. And they end up spending years on years on years just regaining lost tissue. And they hit that point that, you know, after, that they've hit after a couple years and they never really get any further. They just keep going up and down and up and down and up and down. And they never start to reach further because as they hit that, um, their top end, they start to plateau again. They switch it up, which sometimes means regression. Sometimes they give up. So obviously that means regression. And then they get back into it and then they get more growth. And then they never go past that certain plateau or that certain peak that they'd, they'd reached early on in their training and that's because they've never actually put in the time and the thought and the processes behind actual training methodologies to increase their um, hypertrophy and to increase their progression and that's what we're going to address here in this podcast and really this is the first and if you only got to this point in a podcast like you need to take this point away here progression slows down um, as you as you go on in your training career, but it doesn't stop. So what I've done here with this slide in, uh, guys listen to the podcast, there's a, my earlier picture was of a, you know, a, a big spout, a big growth within year one, and then it looks like it's flattened out after year one, and it looks like the growth is, you know, and the progression has almost has stopped. But actually when you zoom in and you look a lot closer to this um, quote unquote thought, uh, you know, uh, plateau, what you'll see is it's not a complete plateau. It's just a much, much, much more shallow incline, which means you're still progressing, but you're progressing at much slower rates, particularly much slower rates than what you're used to. And say on this graph, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, 100% is your like maximal muscle potential, right? I'm not even sure if that even exists, but if we are working towards that, you know, you achieve 75% of it in the first year, then obviously after, every year after that is going to be let slower in terms of gains but it doesn't mean that there's that you actually completely plateau it doesn't mean you have to throw the baby out of the bath water or whatever that expression is it doesn't mean you have to give up it definitely doesn't mean that you have to keep the body guessing and it definitely doesn't mean that you have to quote unquote spark new growth um you, you you need to just keep pushing through as long as you're training effectively as long as what you're doing is working and you're, you've known that because you've followed experts and you've read the, enough literature, or you've got enough of an expertise on this um, subject, or maybe not an expertise, but you just know what's needed and you keep persisting and you keep slowly over time progressing, like you will be adding muscle, but it, it just takes a lot longer, right? And this is, it takes a lot longer as long as you are consistently putting forth the effort, which most people don't. Most people give up on this idea that they're going to continue growing most people give up and they they they're, you know their actual training comes in you know va- peaks and valleys where they'll they'll regress for a few months and then they'll hit back in the gym and then they'll make progress but they never really all they do is recover lost ground and they don't slowly increase over time or maybe they increase even slower because they they reach a new peak which is just slightly higher than the week than the last time they got there and just slightly higher and over time they still make slow progress but it feels like faster because they keep regressing and they keep going back. Um, but the main point of this is you need to spend most of your time gaining muscle, like trying to gain muscle. Um, you can't be spending most of your time trying to lose fat if you if you want consistent progression. And you, maybe, I'm sort of dubious on that now, but you, you want to really keep pushing, like trying to gain muscle, particularly if it's something that you struggle to do. But more importantly is you need to be as consistent with this overload, with this amount of volume in your training to see those gains year after year after year. Otherwise, they just will not happen um, because you can see from this, this this graphic here, you're looking for small growth at best and, and that's when, once you get everything kind of right. Um, and so let's get into s- some real key points that i want to emphasize as to how you can make sure that you do get that growth okay it's there's what we're going to get into here is it's almost like basics mark two right so we went into the basics in the in the um hypertrophy 101 and we discussed exactly like why you want to gain muscle but we also discussed all the general things that you need to keep doing okay 
and, and really, if you just stuck to that and you keep progressing um, year after year after year, you will continue to gain muscle. Now, there are some errors that people see and there's some things that people can almost um, like miss and they, there are some errors that people will think that uh, there are some sort of unique marketing selling points to other things around hypertrophy training. I want to just make sure that we're covered off, that we really make sure that we are progressing our training accordingly and, and using these ideas that I'm going to discuss now, really make sure that we do that. So the first one is using appropriate movements. And that doesn't mean you have to squat, thou shalt squat or thou shalt um, deadlift. In fact, for hypertrophy, the deadlift isn't a great movement because it causes a lot of fatigue and it doesn't move any one muscle throughout a full range of motion. And so straight away, like and a bench press, also a common movement that people think that you must do. Very bad movement for your shoulders. If it works for you, it can work for you. And that's overall the, the point I want to emphasize here is that you're using appropriate movements. I, for example, have just finished a leg day today um, or a lower body day where I, fin I, I did do some squats but I do my squats at the end. And, and if I give my reason for that, this hopefully explains um, what my point here is how, how to appropriately select your movements. If I do squats as my first movement of the day, my, my lower back will be the body part that gives out. I've got, a, I've got annoyingly long legs. I've got a weird, like, long, lanky sort of torso going on as well. It just, like, I, I can push some good weights on the squats and... Um, you know, I can I could be okay, but my lower back is going to be what gives out, and I don't want to um, like hypertrophy my lower back. I want to hypertrophy my legs. So what I go in to do first is I'll do some hack squats, which is this movement that you'll see on the left here, um, with a decent rep range that then fatigues my quads somewhat. I then even do some leg extensions. I do two sets of leg extensions to further fatigue my quad musculature, and then I'll do some back squats. And now I'm using a lighter weight on the back squat that allows me to really fully stimulate still the quads get a good bit of weight under uh get myself under a good bit of weight but not fatigue my lower back and i can really push it so that my legs are the body part that gives out once i get into you know failure points and it's not my lower back i then save my lower back um like that absolute hassle and i'm able to grow my legs accordingly Likewise, for you, if squats just don't work for you, you know, you have some, you have some uh, tight hips or you have dodgy hips or it just doesn't work for you, like there are no movements that you must do, okay? Some movements fatigue you in an extra way that, that, you know, makes it more awkward. Some movements feel pain, make you feel pain in certain areas. The idea is that we're just trying to stimulate the muscle and um, you really want to make sure that you're being as efficient as you can. And that doesn't necessarily, it, it can mean if you're someone that only, can only hit the gym three times a week, that you need to do movements like squats and deadlifts because you need to stimulate as much muscle every time you're in the gym because you can only get there a certain amount of times. Likewise, if you're someone that can make the gym six times a week, then you're causing a whole bunch of fatigue by doing you know, big movements like back squats and, de and deadlifts that might be unnecessary and might enable you to, or might prevent you in your other training sessions from um, effectively overloading the muscle and effectively recovering. So exercise selection should be just what allows you to go for a full range of motion with the musculature that you're trying to aim, with the joint that you're trying to hit. Um, relatively pain-free, you know, obviously the muscle should burn and you should hit that muscle, but um, you should be hitting that, mu the, you should be using a movement that allows you to uh, keep relatively pain-free and progress accordingly. The other thing that you really need to make sure you're doing is, with that, is clean up your technique. So I mentioned there that you want to be using a full range of motion. Now, a full range of motion for each movement might be slightly different, right? Like, for example, um, like Romanian deadlifts, you're not going to bend at the knee, so you're not going to put your hamstrings for a full range of motion from the knee, but you're gonna put your hamstrings through a full range of motion at the hip. Um, here's a good example of um, how you can keep a consistent range of motion is by using things like pendlay rows, or if you're doing bench press, by touching the bar on your chest. And I said bench press isn't perfect, but it's a good example to use. You could use dumbbells. You have certain points that indicate to you that you are using a consistent range of motion. So uh, 
as close to a full range of motion as you can with every movement, but more importantly, it's a consistent range of motion and a controlled tempo. So you're keeping the same speed. Once you've cleaned up the technique in this way, that allows you to progress the weight week to week to week, or at least know that you're progressing the weight week to week to week, and you know that's happening from you getting stronger and therefore building muscle, rather than, you know, we'll see it a lot with um, bent over rows is a perfect example, but it happens a lot with um, squats and bench presses as well, where the more someone adds weight onto the bar, the less range of motion they use. Or um, sometimes it happens for squats, sometimes it happens with other movements. The faster they try and get through, like, like the, you know, sometimes with like when when you get people to try and rep out on on pull ups, they'll just almost let themselves drop. Or they're on a bench press when they try and rep out on the bench press, they'll they'll let that barbell drop and they'll bounce it off their chest, and therefore they're not controlling that tempo, and they're able to get more reps, but they're not overloading the muscle anymore. They're just adjusting the technique in order to then add more weight, and you're then not. Uh, promoting uh, extra growth what you're doing is you're just adding arbitrary weights to the to the lift that you're doing without actually stimulating the muscle in the way that you want to do it so you really want to make sure that you're using a consistent range of motion and you're controlling that tempo that way when you go back to look at your logbook you know that you're actually progressing and you, by virtue of building muscle not by adjusting the technique or hacking away at adding more weight to the bar remember when you're building muscle and everything in strength and condition. No one gives a fuck how much weights you're actually using. What they care about is uh, your actual musculature, your actual performance. Like, no one cares. The only sports where that actually does matter are the barbell sports, like powerlifting and weightlifting and CrossFit, right? That's where training or, or the movements that we are using for training are actually their competition. So, therefore, they want to move as much muscle or they want to move as much weight. Whereas with us, like, if anything, like the less weight you move, the better. If you can build strength on lower weight, great. It gives you less injury risk. It gives you less fatigue. And it allows you to, you know, do it more consistently. And it gives you more potential to build even more. And, like, really, it sounds sort of confusing. But when I play it like that, it, like, makes a lot of sense. And so, again, what you've got to understand is, um, I, I spoke about this earlier, that strength is a skill in itself so um even if you are pushing the rep right you know if you're put if you're adding weight with six to twelve weight uh six to twelve reps on the on the on an exercise that is still building strength it's just not building out and out strength to express within that one one to five rep range um what so what will happen is yes sometimes your one rep max might go down when you're in a hypertrophy phase, that's okay because you're you're in a hypertrophy phase. Okay, you're you're out of the way, out of the skill of being able to uh, express that strength in one to in the one to five rep range. When you're trying to grow, all you're trying to do is a, hit enough volume that you can continue to progress your training week to week to week. So that means that you can continue to grow. Once you've then like grown enough muscle, you can then go back to a one to five rep range to learn how to express that strength with that extra weight on the bar, or with that extra muscle added, sorry. And so um, if you're in an off season, it's the same, it's, it's the exact same as your rugby skill in an off season. If you're in an off season, you're not going to spend that time um, you know, playing as many games of rugby as you can, even though it's an off season and, and, and working on everything you can within rugby. Because it doesn't matter how good you are at rugby in the off-season. What matters is how good you are when the season starts, when you're playing games. And therefore, you then will take a pre-season and you'll know at the beginning of pre-season, this isn't my final form. This isn't exactly how I want to be come the beginning of the, like come when I'm playing really important games. It's the same thing with your muscle in terms of trying to build strength. Okay, If you're in the higher rep ranges and you're adding weight to the bar and you're adding to your logbook then you are getting stronger you're just not you just haven't learned how to express that strength in the one to five rep range because it's it's for it's and again it's another novel stimulus so when you get to it um and wait and this is how you can use hypertrophy to really build up strength is you take some time away from the one to five rep range you work on hypertrophy you work on growing the muscle then when it comes back to a strength phase, 
Yes, you start at a lighter weight, but now that you've added muscle mass to your frame, you've got more potential. So you stick with the, the strength phase for, I don't know, six to 10 weeks, maybe 12 weeks at most, and you'll see your weights um, significantly um, increase at a faster rate than they would have done had you not introduced that hypertrophy phase within your training. So there's always time to, or there's always a good case to add in a hypertrophy phase, particularly when you're away from competition because it allows you, like when you're away from rugby season, because it allows you to grow musculature um, and then grow more potential to have strength, have extra power and keep progressing. So again, Ronnie Coleman here is going to be able to squat a heavy, a decent amount of one for one rep max. He's not interested in doing that. He will then, if he wanted to, if he took the time out of his um, training regime to just do nothing but uh, three to five reps or one, five, three, one or whatever it was, he would then add a significant amount of strength to his squat or uh, to his one rep max and, and like push really, really significantly good numbers. So then the other thing I get asked a lot about is um, weekly splits. So, you know, should I train, if I train chest Monday, do I train uh, legs Wednesday? Um, how do I train it? it? The reality is, it doesn't, the, the, like, this uh, is one of the pains of my life. This is something that is discussed so often. It is just mental masturbation. There is no, like, it is just completely um, overplayed. There, There is no special um, split that is going to be perfect for you. I'm a big advocate of the high-low split, which isn't something that I'm going to get into in this podcast. I suggest you Google rugby muscle high-low split, and I'll go. Uh, there is a video there of me explaining exactly how to do that. Um, there's also podcasts on this exact topic. But really, it's it's you've got to figure out where you, how often you can train. So we've got to break it down and, and individualize these splits to you. Because so often I see people, you know, change up their training and they just add in a day ad nauseum or they just switch it up and they think that that's what's going to cause their growth. No, your training is done, like your body just responds to stimulus that you give it. It doesn't know what day is what day. It doesn't know what stimulus is what stimulus. Or it doesn't know, you know, like if you're doing chest and back, it doesn't care, you know, if you're splitting up the body parts. Like none of that really matters at all. What matters is when can you train consistently? So look at your weeks, look at your schedule, your day-to-day schedule, your week-to-week schedule, and ha- how much can you consistently commit? Not how much can you commit on your best week. So say, oh, oh this week maybe I can get in five. Next week, oh, I've got a really busy week. But, you know, this week I can get in five. Let's get in five. No. How much, what is the least amount of sessions that you can consistently commit? Or what's the most amount of sessions that you can consistently commit to? And that is... Eat on your in your absolute worst week can you still commit four to five sessions if that's a yes boom that's how many sessions you're going to go then you're going to start to divvy out your training over those days and you're going to divvy out your training over those days according to when you're going to be freshest aka like training it around your rugby training like maybe doing back squats the morning after heavy rugby training or the day after a game is not a good idea Maybe doing them on a Tuesday in the morning is a really great idea. That's probably the best time to do it. Particularly if you're playing Saturday and you've got tough training on Tuesday evening. That would be when I would say the best time to do it. When are you doing, and like how many days are you doing consecutive sessions? How many days are you doing consecutive movements? Um, And there is no right or wrong answer. You can train full body six days a week. It would just mean that you would rather than do eight, sets every single day you would do your eight days that you used to do twice or eight sets that you used to do twice a week and you would divvy them up and you would do i don't know three sets on each day or two sets on one day and three sets on the next and then two sets on the next and you would still hit the same amount of total rep range but you would use a lot more weight and you could um you know you'd be get more effect out of those sessions um you've also then got to figure out you know, when you're going to be fatigued, what could you do on those days that you're fatigued? And you've also got to make sure that you really avoid, I mean, really have at least one day of rest minimum. Um, I don't like the approach where people work five consecutive days and then they have two complete days of rest when they're training. I think it's better to um, have one day off in the midweek and one day off on the Sunday. 
However, that's not the way most, you know, some people work it. Um, but I would avoid a, a complete approach of feast or, and famine where you, you know, wait, train for four consecutive days and then have three days off. Or if you train for three consecutive days and have four days off, that's just too much of a gap in between. But then other than that, um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can take a screenshot of this um, <clears throat> picture here and you would apply it to however you want. This is me applying the high-low split. So low would just be, you know, you could still do compound movements. You would do non-neurally fatiguing movements. So you wouldn't do, maybe you wouldn't do heavy bench and you wouldn't do heavy deadlifts or you wouldn't do heavy um, squats. Those would be saved for your um, high days. But really in general, like it doesn't matter what body parts you hit on what days. It's just you, it's better to have a high stress day followed by a low stress day or a recovery day. I did, as you can see here, there's no days consecutively where we've got two high days. We've done, there are some where we've got a couple low days in a row, and it would be however you would want to play it. We've got several different circumstances here. So, you know, in off season or pre season, you would start out with a low day on a Monday, high day Tuesday, have some active recovery, or you could take it off, or you could have another low down the Wednesday. You would do a high day um, on the Thursday low day Friday, high day Saturday, and you've got Sunday to completely recover. Same, you could do the exact same methodology for an in-season, just that you replace that high day by a game, and you probably want to recover on that Friday, shifting the low day to the Wednesday, or you could recover on a Sunday, and you would have one of those Friday days, Friday or Sunday, completely off, and that, and that would be up to you and how you approach your training. Four times a week, if we're now not considering any games or anything, you could run, you could run, as long as you're running two high days, you'd be fine. Um, so here we've got Monday low, Tuesday high, Wednesday off, Thursday high, Friday off, Saturday low, and then Sunday off. And therefore, there you've seen my approach that we've, we've spread out our rest days throughout so that we're making sure that we are recovering. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these different splits. If you want to, if you're listening to the podcast, go check out the YouTube channel. And I've run for. I've got an example of three, five, and six, as well as four, as, for all different high-low variations. Body parts, as I've said already, can do what the fuck they want. Um, you can do upper-lower recovery, push-pull legs, for example, for a five-day split. That works really well. You could do uh, upper-lower um, full full body, um, upper-lower. You could do legs pu pull push, legs push pull. You could do upper, you could do, you could do um, five full body days, but you just prioritize by way of giving more sets. So you could do um, full body on Monday, but your upper takes priority, which means, you know, maybe you do, let's say you do 12 or 15 sets of upper body, but you still do six sets of lower body. Likewise, then you come back the next day and you do the same but in reverse. So you do 10 sets of lower body and then you, so you still smash it and then you still do, you know, a few sets of curls or some flies or you work on your weak body parts or whatever you want to do on your upper body. Um, you could have a day where you develop only your weaknesses. You, how you div divvy up your training um, in terms of muscle groups doesn't really matter as long as you are getting, you know, as long as it makes sense to you, right? So you don't want to do, uh, Monday, Tuesday, training your chest and then train uh, heavy on Monday and, and then training uh, uh, chest light on Tuesday and then having that full rest of the week off. Obviously, then you're getting two stimuluses, but they're at the same time and then, you, and then you're hitting that feast and famine sort of idea where you've now got five days to recover where you could have just, if you would have put that lighter chest session on the Friday, then you've got more time in between and you've, you're actually getting two consistent stimuluses to keep pushing that muscle. And like I said, people overthink this too much. So I've, you know, there are a million different ways that this can work and there are a million different ways that you can fuck this up. So as long as we understand that progression isn't linear, then we can keep really um, understanding that like, you can't just continue to add reps and weight like you did in the first, and you did in the... Um, you know, when you're a beginner, you have to really try and make sure that you're uh, tracking your weights, tracking your reps. Um, don't consistently just continually chase those reps and, and really push yourself forever and ever and ever. Like chasing 
chasing reps and chasing weight that's not there like it should happen because muscle should grow but sometimes it just doesn't happen and that's okay and you just take that for what it is and you assess and maybe you eat more food or maybe you you know you take a deload depending on your fatigue but you don't chase that number you like that's not you don't um will your way to grow muscle you progress your training accordingly and you grow muscle accordingly so don't chase that don't chase the weights don't like um really get married to the idea that you're you're smashing the weights every week doing doing that week on week on week just ends up making you lift like an idiot and that's why we cleaned up our technique as we showed earlier you also really want to make sure that you stay on track so you know you don't want to keep switching up movements every four weeks or every two weeks or every week um, to quote unquote keep the body guessing that's really fucking stupid you want long-term tracking you want long-term consistent performance so that you know that your increases are coming from added muscle that therefore you can you know express that by lifting more weights or doing more reps and like i've said before you make this commitment to your training and then you uh, um you know you you finish out your training block however long that is whether it's um ideally like two to three months you you, you really put your head down and you chase and you, and you consistently stay on that training block only once you finish that training block do you then assess your data don't keep trying to make changes don't keep trying to switch it up and panic after a couple of weeks of non-progression just stick with it if you believe in your in, in your training that you've put yourself you know you've put together for yourself or as someone's put together for you don't change it on a whim keep consistent with this stuff because muscle growth takes a long long time to do properly and so with that in mind like you know really you're not trying to add five kilos to the bar every single week. You're, you're adding maybe a kilo to the bar. Maybe you're adding a rep every week and you're only adding a kilo to the bar every four, four weeks or every two months. Like that's absolutely normal. So you progress by having a rep range, whether that's you know, eight to 10, eight to 12, 12 to 15, five to eight, and you work within that rep range. Once you've reached the top of that rep range, you could add um, extra weight to the bar only once you've reached the top of that rep range, not once you've hit the, the lowest progress it slowly you can then add in sets to priority body parts also slowly as you keep continuing to progress and then you're monitoring your conditions so how are you fed when you go training um you know how was your technique how does the body feel with that technique like you know how are you feeling with each session and um, making sure that your rest is saying similar or the same and therefore you know that the progression has come if technique stays perfect and if the rest is similar and you you know you're in a similar states then you know that the extra reps or the extra weight has come from extra muscle likewise if you haven't added reps or you haven't added weight you you know you might know that something's a little bit off this week and, and you know that and you're not you know trying to deadlift like a fucking cat to overcome that okay so really making sure that you're avoiding all the hype I put hyper but you're avoiding the hype right um like crazy drop sets crazy different things that become difficult to track like that just adds extra stress to your you know your actual training regime like to track that stuff to do that stuff to set up all these wacky techniques it's a lot of hassle for very 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 minimal if any benefit negligible benefit if it, i don't think it gives you any benefit i'm gonna go just go out and say it like it doesn't spark new growth it doesn't do anything it just gives you a novel stimulus whereas if you just stay consistent we know that the basics are better than everything. We know that the scale should be going up. We know that we should be getting stronger. And if we stay within our rep range and we progress our training accordingly like this, then we are going to, over time, over the years, or over the months, slowly add muscle to our frame. Believe me on that. Okay? Goes back to what I said before. We track with our body weight, calipers, pitchers. We track our diet. We track our stuff in the weight room. And this is what this is part of. And we can make that commitment. And only after we've reached that end of that commitment do we assess, do we figure out what we can do better. Because you're not in a rush to add so much you know, muscle to your frame. Remember, when you're a child, like, and you're in your prime time to grow as a human, right? Kids are adding, what, f four kilos or something a year to their frame? And that's including bone and organs and all that shit. This stuff takes a long, long time, and it can be done. And, you know, if you're someone that's invested in your training and you're someone that's, that's 
spent two months training and then two months off and then two months. If you just add consistent training and you, and you add progression, you stay consistent with this stuff, you can make remarkable process, progress, but it doesn't happen overnight. Okay. Um, that makes, that wraps up this podcast for now. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, as always, we've run 40 minutes here. So top information. I hope you guys can apply it to your training. Thumbs up on the YouTube comments. Um, let me know any questions that you have for the next one. But really, if you just apply these first two videos and these first two podcasts and like consistently stick to them over the years, you will add growth. You will add muscle to your frame. I have no doubt of that. Um, thank you so much, you guys, for listening. And I'll see you. Hope you're enjoying this new series, by the way. Um, rugby muscle applied. Let me know um, by giving us a five-star review or in the comments below. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.